Our next speaker is uh, Hema Murthy. The title of her talk is Building Speech Synthesis Systems for Indian Languages. And her work was recently covered in the media, so I read out from a recent report in Economic Times. The report says, if you're using an Indus OS-based smartphone in India, chances are that you'd be able to convert text to speech in a native Indian language with a click of a button. The process of converting text to any Indian language is the result of 15 years, more than 20,000 hours of work by Dr. Hema Murthy and Mumbai-based Indus OS. The partnership resulted in Indus Reader, which is used in smartphones manufactured by Micromax, Cellcon, Carbon, and Swipe, among others. So she's going to be talk, talking about this, how to synthesize speech in um, Indian languages. So, and I, uh, so Professor Hema Murthy is a professor in uh, computer science and engineering in IIT Madras. So welcome. Yeah, uh, can you hear me after that first talk? And I'm sure you had a wonderful talk on mathematics. This is going to be completely other end of the spectrum, where we'll show you how, what it takes to build systems. And I'm going to talk about building speech synthesis systems for Indian languages. And as you can see, the number of institutions that were involved in this effort, although the newspaper item says I did it, I did not do it by myself. There is a huge team of my scholars and uh, staff and this across various institutions. There were about 100 to 150, more, more like 150 engineers who worked uh, relentlessly for the last uh, seven, eight years. But we started this work in IIT Madras more than almost 30 years ago. And we were doing it single-handedly, and we were just building demo systems. But it takes a lot of effort to finally make things happen and put them onto a smartphone. I have a smartphone here, which I can show you later, if any of you are interested, to play this thing. So what is so, uh, so let's look at, what I'm going to do is I, I kind of organize my talk like this. I'll tell you what text-to-speech synthesis is about. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit about languages of India. I'm always fascinated by the various families that we have in India. There are about six different families of languages in India. And then I'll talk about how we go at building it. Building text-to-speech systems involves what is called machine learning. And all of you know this big data business. And we were the speech guys were the first to start the big data business because we had no other solution except using big data. So you have to collect data properly. And when you want to do what is called vocabulary independent speech synthesis, you know, unlike your, um, all of you have heard, no? uh, ek number platform say Ravana Hogi. You don't want that. You want to say ek number platform say Ravana Hogi. You want to say that. So that means you have to do a lot of work for this and what is the effort that, uh, that we did. And um, one thing is, because we live in India, see, you must remember that in America they have English. They work on English. And nowadays, they started working on Mandarin, and they have started working maybe Spanish to some extent, but no other languages. And everything is done independent of the other. Europe, for example, almost every country has one language with which they work. In India, uh, let me ask you a question. How many languages are there in the world, and how many languages are there in India? One answer. How many languages in the world? More than? 2,000 is little underestimate. There are 6,419 languages in the world. Out of this, how many in India? Uh, one third is more or less correct. There are 1,652 Indian languages. And I must tell you, even that is a wrong number. Because, for example, something like Hindi, what is the percentage of population that speaks Hindi? Or what the government claims? More than that. 29% is what is spoken by standard Hindi, which is your Delhi, uh, UP, Latnavi to some extent. But they include what are called 48 different dialects of Hindi, your Maithili, your Bhojpuri, your Ghadwali. Everything is considered Hindi. And if any of you have moved in the north, you know that there's absolutely more or less no connection between these uh, languages, which they call Hindi. Okay, So that is the... And despite calling one language as Hindi, we have 1,652 languages. And out of this, let me ask you another quiz question. 
why did they decide that uh, there were 22 Indian languages which are official, now it's going to become 23, and it's going to become 30 soon. What is this based upon? Can you give me an answer for this? From where do you get 23? Why is it on your rupiah note, you know, there is so many languages? What are these based upon? How do they choose? As I said, there are 1652 languages. So how do you go about choosing 23 of them to come in your rupiah note? Why do you decide that all official languages will be some 23 of them? Spoken population matters a lot. It's about 100,000 people speaking a language. Then that language gets what is called an official status. Today there are 23. It's ex officially we have 22. It's becoming 23. It's expected to become 30 soon. Okay? That's, the, that's the kind of diversity that we have. And so there's a lot of issue with languages. And so what we had to do was when we're building text-to-speech senses, I'll tell you what it is. You type in text and it must play out the text. Let me say what's the big deal about it. But I'll show you what is the big deal about it because it's taken a lot of time. But the problem is, most importantly, we have to deal with this issue that I can't work for Hindi alone. I can't work for Tamil alone or Malayalam alone. I have to ensure that I have a unified framework because you know, otherwise my lifetime is not enough to build 1,600 languages. I mean, today I've done, we have done some 13, and tomorrow you want to do a 14th language. Somebody else wants to do a 15th language and so on. So what is important about our work is we came up with a completely common framework for all the languages, despite there being Aryan, uh, Dravidian. Aryan, Dravidian, uh, uh, Marathi is actually called a language which is a hybrid between Aryan and Dravidian languages. And there are languages, sino tibetan like Bodo and things like that. Irrespective of these languages, we must use one single common framework to do that. And that's what I'm going to talk about. And that's where this issue of segmentation comes in. I'll talk a little bit about that. And there's a little bit of, I'll give you a little bit of, you know, it's not totally only technology. We did some signal processing. And uh, Sushmita was saying, why not? It's also mathematics. But, well, most mathematicians don't accept us as mathematicians, but nevertheless, I will talk about some experiments, results, and what is the scope for improvement, and what are the things that we have done. So let's be start with the outline. We start with an input text in a particular language. The objective of a text-to-speech synthesis system is to produce natural and intelligible speech output. What do we mean by this? The whole thing is completely vague. Natural and intelligible output as decided by the consumer's you. To give you an idea, you know, we build this technology, so, oh, this is sounding very nice, except that one word is wrong, it's not sounding very good. Then you have an audience like this, people who wear headphones and listen to it, say, oh, this is crap, because one word is bad, and they will give you very poor feedback on that. So we all depend a lot on you. And uh, what are the applications? I think, especially in the context of inclusiveness, it becomes very important. Let me ask you another question now. What is the percentage of disability in India does anybody have any idea? The official figures are 3%. Out of that, 1.5% people are visually challenged. And there's no reason why these people cannot be brought into the mainstream. We have not developed technology enough to work for them. You will always find a person who is visually challenged will go and do a Tamil literature, history, and uh, so on. Why is it that people maybe have a very good, uh, you know, mathematics head or a development head? Maybe can do technology experiments. Why not? So this is something that we need to look at, and we want, most importantly today, people like me, for example, I'm not very good with all of this. I'd like perhaps I used to, I also use a smartphone. I would like perhaps you know highlight something and read the text. Can it read the text for me? What is there? And uh, language challenge. There are other psychites of people who are language challenge. People with cerebral palsy is another, again, significant disability in our country, primarily because women don't go to the hospitals on time. And uh, motor disability is a very common disability that we have. And for these people to enable speech is a very big thing. And we, most importantly, we wanted to build text-to-speech synthesis systems for a long, for a large number of Indian languages with a short turnaround time for any new Indian language. To give you an idea, in the West, people have spent about 30, 40 years building one language DTS system. We were given by the government when it funded us, it said, OK, guys, uh, five years. Now build it for 13 Indian languages. We got for first three years, and they said five, six. But then we just took it because you know, for the first time, the government is showing some interest in building something like this. 
Okay. So the what does speech synthesis involve? As I said, you type in text and you want it to play. Now, what's the issue with Indian languages? Each one has its own script. Okay. Right. This is a problem for us. How do you? Of course, you, there's something called operating systems are enabled with Unicode, but nevertheless, you don't. Although we claim that in Indian languages you speak exactly what you write, it's not really correct. Tamil, for example, I know how many of you are Tamilians here. Okay. You know, there's something, let me give you this. When you write thandan, the word thandan, the first tha and the second tha have an identical representation. But the first one is pronounced tha, and the second one is pronounced the. We have lots of such issues. And then you have borrowed words from Sanskrit and so on and so forth. We need to parse appropriately. So one thing is, um, when you talk about what's called vocabulary independent speech senses, what do I mean by that? In your railway um, announcement system, what is done is they record phrases. And the phrases are just put together one after the other and played out. You know, Ravana. Uh, Platinum, platform number one, one will platform will be recorded. Then one, two, three, four, five, whatever, if you have 15 platforms, that will be recorded. One, say, Ravana, Hogi. This kind of thing will be recorded. They just put them all together. And this is not vocabulary independent. It's vocabulary dependent because you have a finite set of words or phrases which are recorded. And depending upon the context, you just connect all of them and play them back. Okay. But what we are talking about is, I'd like to pick up something from the website and put it into our system and play it. Then what is the issue that we have? We have to ensure that it should be, you know, there is no recorded sentence that is there for the sentence that you're seeing on the web. In the, on the web. And the idea is, can we break this down into smaller and smaller units and then put them back together and then play it back? What is the issue with something like this? You can take, you know, to give you an idea, if I take a... Can I use the board here? If I have a sentence like this, you know, I'd say, let's say, most of you are Tamil, right? Let's say I say something like this. Some, um, and what I could do is, the way we do it is you have the corresponding text. And you have a corresponding audio waveform, which looks like this, let us say. And then we see on this audio waveform, where does ka occur, where does ma occur, where does la occur, where does ba occur, where does this e occur, it, so on. This is a complete audio waveform that is there. We just cut it into pieces. Then I have a dictionary of waveforms. Okay. Then if I want to produce, so what do I have to do? I have to make sure there's something called the smallest unit. To give you an idea, the way we do it is, if I have this, what I've written here is Kamala. I'm just writing it in uh, what you call the, um, in what is called the International Phonetic Alphabet. We just simply divide it into what are called phonemes. Okay? These are the fundamental units of, uh, these are fundamental linguistic units. Why do I call it a linguistic unit? Given a text, you split it into this. For example, what is this? This is ik, a, im. A, uh, il, a. Uh. Okay? But il, for example, I'm prefixing it with what's called a vowel e. Ik, I prefix it with a vowel e. So it's interesting that the fundamental linguistic unit, the written form, and what we produce has no connection. Okay? What we produce is what are called syllables, and whereas what we write for convenience are the linguistic units. So the wave form and the script that we use are not exactly one-to-one -one related. So what happens is we, um, what we, the way we can pronounce this is, is I can say k, ma, and la. This is what I can say very easily. I, I cannot say ik because I'm, when I'm saying ik, I'm prefixing it with a vowel. Okay, so that's the problem. So the, or im, for example, again I'm prefixing it with a vowel e. So what we do is, we can say ka, ma, la, I can say. And these are called syllables, and these are the fundamental units of speech production. But nevertheless, this is very convenient. This representation is very convenient because I can get these smallest units, and there are about, for all languages of the world, in Indian languages, we have 35 uh, consonants, and we have about 
maximum of 18 bubbles, making it 52 or 53, no more than that. So I get a, have a vocabulary of 53 units. Ideally, I would like these 53 units. So it's very simple, no? take the waveform, cut it at these points, and put it in your database and pick it up. Then what is the issue? The issue is that speech production. So basically what I'm asking, I'm asking someone to record it and dividing the waveform at these fundamental units, creating a dictionary of these units, a new sentence comes, I look at that dictionary, for example, from here, let us say, I want to do key math. Okay, let us say I want to do, uh, Mm. Let's say kill or something like that. So what do I do? I take from here, K here, this is there here. Let's say, let's assume that I had recorded Kamala here. And what I would do is I have a database of K, a, M and L. And oh, I don't have, let's say, let me call this call here. Uh, actually it's CA, but the pronunciation is KALL. So what I would do is I look at this database, pick up the waveform for K, R, L and done. Right, so it looks like a very simple task. But unfortunately, what happens is speech production is an inertial process. What is an inertial process? The whole production system is an inertial system. It's very difficult for you to move from one unit to another without having the effect of one on the other. Okay? So if I look at, uh, I'll tell you, it's a, um, it's a very, um, if I looked at Ker E and Ker A, the cur here and the cur here and will look very, very different. Key is what we call a front vowel, E, and A is what is called a back vowel. So what happens is your tongue hump. What is the difference between vowels and consonants? Why do we write them separately? Indian language is a wonderful that way. Hmm. What do you mean by direct voice? Uh, there's no constriction when you're, for example, when you're producing the vowels, there is a tube still, but through the tube, for example, your tongue hum. See, at the same time, if you say direct voice, then A, E, A, O, U, everything should look the same. So the tongue hum, humps at various places. Okay, if A, for example, the tongue hump will be at the back, E, the tongue hump is in the front, Okay, A, the tongue hump is in the middle, and so on. U, the tongue hump is at the back. At the same time, you'll see, when I look at A and U, which are both back vowels, the tongue hump is high at the back. The difference is that U is rounding, where your lips round, whereas with your A, the mouth is kept open. So this is what differentiates. But the basic problem is when I want to say key versus ka, you're anticipating that I want to say kill. So what you're... The, the ka is actually touching the, obviously ka is a cons consonant. So the tongue has to touch the roof somewhere. So where does it touch? Can you tell me our scripts, you know, you say kha, kha, ga, ga, cha, 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 kha, cha, tha, tha, pha. Why did they do that? Depending on which ka is at the back, not which part of the mouth. It's actually beautiful. The script is, doesn't matter which Indian language. Ka is at the back, the tongue touches at the back. Ch is what is called the palate, then you have the alveolar, then you have the dental, and then you have the lips. K, ch, th, th, p. Okay, this is how our script is made like this, from back to front. Okay, so what happens is this K is at the back. Okay, A is at the back, but E is in the front. So what we do is, I know I'm going to say E. So what I do is, I move the tongue for key a little front. I'll move the E a little back. And I'm speaking because we're all lazy. We don't want to spend too much effort in saying some things. So when I say ka and when I say ki, I will make sure that I make all these adjustments. But this begins a lot of problem because what does it, what does it entail for us? It says when I'm looking at ka in the context of a and I'm looking at ka in the context of e, the both of them are going to be very different. I can't pick one ka and put it in the other place. That is the fundamental problem that we have. And that's why we do a huge big data analytics. We say, pick up ka in every possible context. Pick up a in every possible context. Pick up e in every possible context. And then we put it through a machine learning algorithm and say, find the appropriate context for synthesis and play it back. Okay, that's the, that is the fundamental problem for us. So I hope I have impressed upon you why this is a difficult problem. To give you an idea, in the West, people collect 
for every language about 100 hours of data. Your Google Navigator, I know how many I use it a lot because I have very bad directions, which figures out what is the context and generates the waveform. We primarily use the machine learning algorithm because the uh, waveform based census, the database becomes very large because even if you're collecting something like we have collected about 10 hours of data. For 10 hours of data, it occupies about 700 MB of space. It's a huge amount of space, which you can't fit in a cell phone. So we use a statistical model to do something like this. So coming to Indian scripts, it's very interesting. These are all based on the ancient Brahmi script, which most of you know. Writing systems correspond to what are called aksharas. And akshara is ka, cha, ta, ta, pa. Ka, you never say ik, ich. You say ka, cha, ta, ta, pa. So ka followed by the vowel. The consonant followed by the vowel, these are called aksharas. And Indian scripts are primarily what we call syllabic in nature. What is a syllable now? It has a vowel in the center. It can have any number of consonants before, any number of consonants after. The C star means it can have one or more consonants. A vowel by itself is also a syllable. A C star, V C star is what we have. And in Indian languages, we have what are called a cluster of consonants. Kra, for example. Okay. And vowel is a, for example. Cv is ka. Um, uh, pra, for example, is a. Uh, and we can have up to three consonants is very common. And having three consonants at the end is also very common in the context of syllables. And we had Aryan and Dravidian. Originally, the uh, scripts have the sounds were less similar, but thanks to the migration between and this, um, you know, a lot of. Um, moving around and so on and so forth. Languages have also merged and you find that we can finally say that there are, there are about 50 units, 35 to 38 consonants and 15 to 18 vowels, but no language will have more than 52 or 53 units. What is the difference in these languages? If you look at the South Indian languages, which are the Dravidian languages and the North Indian languages, which are the Aryan languages, you'll find that most of them have a same, similar set of sounds. South Indian languages especially came from History of South Indian languages? Proto Dravidian and Proto Dravidian split off into Proto Tamil and Proto Kannada. And from Proto Tamil came, proto, came the modern day Malayalam and Tamil. And Proto Kannada came the modern day Kannada and Telugu. I mean, Tamilians don't feel too proud that original Tamil had no relationship to the Tamil that is there. All this are just names that are given. So interestingly, if you look at the South Indian languages, you will find that most of the sounds are same. We do not have aspiration, although people came, claim, khe, for example, khal, khana. We have borrowed a lot of Sanskrit words with aspiration. It's really not there in our text. And even when we pronounce it, we don't pronounce it. Sounds are more or less the same. But what is it that is different? The sequencing of the sounds is what, make, what makes the difference. Why is uh, Telugu called the Italian of the East? How many Telugu speakers here? Okay, and what do you call Tamil? You call? Tamil is referred to as Aravam. Aravam means noise. Okay, imagine both of them have come from the same parent, but the difference is Telugu has beautiful vowel endings. You'll never say bulb, you'll say balbu. <laughs> it's a very common thing, okay, because it's, and I, no, don't laugh about it. The vowel ending makes it so beautiful. That's the reason why it's called Italian of the East. In Tamil, on the hand, we do cut, cut, cut. Everything is always cut at the end. There's no vowel. Okay, that's the fundamental difference. So basically, these are, this is called phonotactics. The sequencing of the sounds is what we call phonotactics, and that's what makes it different between these languages. Okay, now how did we perform data collection? So what we normally do is in the West or anywhere, we take about you know we collect large amount of text and the corresponding waveforms, they have to be very accurate in terms of the transcription. What do I mean by transcription? You have the acoustic waveform. Acoustic waveform is a waveform that you record, and the corresponding text must be very accurate. If it's not accurate, it's not going to work at all. But the problem is, at the same time, how much do I collect? You know, so what we do is we do something called op optimal text uh, collection. That is, as I said, right, ka in various contexts in various contexts. So how many different contexts should I worry about to record the same waveform? So we have to spend a lot of time on that. And um, we collected about 60 to 70,000 unique words. We took sources, online newspapers. And interestingly, what we found was to produce what is called vocabulary independent census, the fundamental, the, the best source was 
children's books and we use Chandamama in a very big way to collect all the texts. Primary reason being, especially South Indian languages and even North Indian languages, these are called agglutinative. What is agglutinative? Vandu poi kondi rikiran. It's very common for us. It's a single word in Tamil. It is the connection of vandu poi kondu irikiran. Okay. When, it, when you do all this, the sounds get completely compressed and when I take a sound from that word and put it somewhere else, it will sound terrible. So we have to do a lot of work. And we collected about, we built what are called pronunciation dictionaries also, although we don't use them now, we have a good parser. When we did five, five hours of uh, each language, only male and female, remember, compare it with the 100 hours that others are using. We only done five languages. This just gives you a statistics of number of sentences, number of words, and for all 13 languages that we have collected, and uh, how we select the optimal text. What we do is we look at the various contexts. We see, um, we, uh, once we collect these texts, we look at the various contexts and ensure that most of the frequent contexts are included in the database when we do the recording. At the same time, we also ensure that we do not have these long words. It's very common, you know, Indians make paragraph long sentences. It's a very big problem with us. So whereas if you look at an English sentence, it'll be about 1.5 seconds long. An Indian language sentence normally is about six seconds long. We had to restrict people, we restricted the text to maximum 15 seconds. And another thing is, when you, uh, another important problem is person has to maintain the same rate at which he or she speaks, like a newsreader. A newsreader who reads a news item and they cannot read it in 10 minutes or you know, uh, 12 minutes or whatever. It has to be read in the 15 minutes. That means there is a rate. The number of syllables that they produce per second should be preserved. If that is not preserved, you have a lot of difficulty. So what kind of people we use? We use people who are newsreaders, radio jockeys and so on and they cost us a lot to give you an idea we tried to get somebody called Niti Ravindran and she said she wants 1.5 lakhs for 15 minutes the government had given us you know 5 lakhs for the entire data set to be collected so we realized this is not good enough for us so that's also, that's also something that we have to look at uh, so finally I'm showing you a waveform this is a syllable the one syllable another syllable and so on and this is what is called the spectrogram why have I put the spectrogram? Spectrogram is a frequency, is a function of time. This is time, and this is the waveform as a function of time. Why do I put a spectrogram? Because the spectrogram, for example, I don't know whether you can see this over here. There is a dark bar over here, which corresponds to the resonance of the vocal tract. So what's happening is, here the person has changed the sound, and we want to, it wants to reach this part, but slowly reaches this part. So we have to ensure this when we are producing the speech back. I hope you can see this here. If you notice, this is very important for us. It's starting similarly here. Something is starting here, and then finally it's trying to go somewhere else. It's constant, and then it changes. But notice that it changes slowly, similarly here. It changes slowly. It's reading a steady state here. It reaches slowly. So we have to ensure all of this when we do synthesis of speech. Okay. So what, as I already told you, I need to ensure that this waveform is cut very carefully at the units. As I said, I can't get humans to do it because human beings make a lot of mistakes. So one thing is that what we do is, as I said, because we want context, we say let us be, divide the waveform at, you know, because when you hear two, you cannot hear the ik part of it. So we said, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? For every unit, if I'm looking at k in the context of r and m on either side, M in the context of a previous R and the following R. This is called a triphone because I have three units in sequence. Or if it is a syllable, it is K, M, and L. Okay. So the various ways of doing it, we use a syllable because it's a more natural production unit. Okay. So what we do is, and um, the speech synthesis is actually harder than speech recognition because. When you speak, for example, today, I don't know how many of you have used Google Voice. It gives you a transaction success. What do I mean by that is, what's, what's there on my calendar today, you can ask. And I'll say, you have a meeting at 11.30. It'll tell you that. But it's not going to transcribe when I say, what is there on my calendar? It's not going to do that. It's going to pick that word calendar there and say, perhaps something, use the context, I'm trying to go somewhere, and say, this is there on my calendar. 
So it does not have to do a good transcription. Whereas for speech synthesis, on the other hand, we have to divide this waveform into units very, very accurately. Okay? And an aside, before that, let me talk about we, what we did. As I said, I've been talking about this for a long time, that uh, we need a uniform way of looking at Indian languages. This is an aside here. We had, because the text is, the text is written in Tamil script, the text is written in Telugu script, and so on. But we came up with what is called a common, based on the attributes of the sounds. As I said, there's an Aryan Dravidian division. And within the Aryan, there's a set of divisions. Within the Dravidian, there's a set of divisions. So what we did was came up with a completely common set of labels, common set of rules, and so on. And I'll just show you a little bit later what this is what we did. So this is your common label set over here. And if here, if you notice, this is Tamil. If you can see something here, I'm sorry, it's not very clear. This is just to show that the common label set across all the Indian languages. I've shown four languages here. We've done this for 13 Indian languages. And it scales for any number of languages, not an issue at all. Spent a lot of time building this. And then we had to also ensure that the, the processing was right. Let's look at this. When I look at this, the written form is Akhabara, right? Asafala. If you notice it, both Asafala and Akhabara are written in the same way. But when I'm looking at, when I'm Processing ak akhabara, it should be akbar, and asafal, it should be. These are different. If I use this, for example, if I used the same processing scheme as I did for akbar here, this would be asfal, whereas it has to be asafal. And a lot of similarly, Taj, Taj Mahal and Pagalpan. If I did the same way as I process Taj Mahal, this will be Pagalpan. Taj Mahal, Paglapan, the same way of processing. If you notice that written form is consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel. Okay? So we had to do a lot of work for this. Interesting, we have found a whole lot of new rules. And it's interesting that linguists have not noticed this, but we spend a lot of time, we use a lot of machine learning to find these rules out. And it picks up these rules very correctly and does this. And then another issue is this agglutinative and native nature, as I call Vandu Kondi Irikiran. Vandu Kondi Irikiran. It's a problem. Similarly with Malayalam, you have the same thing. Vannu kundi rikkunnu, I think. This is, and so this is also a problem for us. So we need to process all this uh, properly, and that's what we did. Okay. So building speech sensor systems for Indian languages, what is normally done is the following. The easiest way to do it is you take small amount of data, manually label it. Yes? Problem in the previous slide? Uh, this one. Yes. This is, this has to be parsed okay. into, this is actually three words which are put together. Okay. When you speak, for example, it's a vandu kondi rikiran, you will say. So the idea is, when there's a, what happens is there is a, uh, what is called a geminate consonant. I'm a little, I'm not talking about it. What happens is when you join two words, vandu kondi rikiran, vandu kondi, you put two k's over here, and this, um, this pair of consonants and vowels will look different from this and this. These are called geminate consonants. It's very common, even in Hindi, patti, for example, right? You can't take pat and ti, it won't work. You have to uh, do some parsing to ensure that it gets the correct sound properly. OK, yeah, you know, conversations with me, please, if you do not mind. Uh, the red kurta here, can you please talk to me? I would appreciate less, less one hour, I will uh, let you off. Okay, thank you. So basically what we found was the fundamental problem, as I said, whether it's agglutinative nature or sounds, for example, we need to get the waveforms really accurate. That was a fundamental problem. So what did we do to this? I'm just going to, um, normally what is done is, you take some amount of data, it's called bootstrapping. You know, take 10 minutes of data, somewhat accurately mark it. Then you build a machine learning model and ask it to transcribe the rest of the data, get the boundaries. But that is fine if you have huge amounts of data. When you have five or six hours of data, it's very difficult to get the boundaries exactly accurate. And I will show you some examples for this. So what we did was, and not only that, perceiving these boundaries manually is very difficult. And we have found that even with small amounts of data labeled manually, it doesn't really work. This force Viterbi alignment is what is called a machine learning algorithm that is used. Phone models are phone machine learning models that are built. Then you keep on rebuilding models. That is, you transcribe, you assume it's correct, take it back, put it, and re keep relearning it. There are a lot of inconsistencies, inconsistencies across annotators. So standard way of doing it is there's something called a hidden Markov model. Hidden Markov model, for you 
to just understand that it's possible to model sequences. That's all you need to know, sequences of sounds. So what we do is we take the waveform initially, assume that the boundaries occur at equal intervals. If I have a one second utterance and I have, let us say, 10 phonemes into it, I will simply divide each second into 100 milliseconds and say first 100 milliseconds corresponds to the first sound, second milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. This is called a flat start training algorithm, which is what most people in the West use. And then you rebuild it. But we found that this was not really working very well. And the fundamental drawback of this particular approach is that we know that the speech production unit, as I said, is a syllable. You can speak only in terms of syllables. The machine learning algorithm does not include this fact. At the syllable, there has to, you will be able to see a difference. And I'll show you in a little while what we mean by that. So I'll come back to this. And um, this is exactly what it, this is what the waveform looks like. There's one syllable, another syllable, third syllable, fourth syllable. And clearly, when you, you know, you, you, you yourself can draw that boundary without any difficulty, right, when you look at the waveform. And for us signal processing engineers, it should be trivial to do something like this. Unfortunately, the machine learning algorithm does not include this information about the boundary that here there is a syllable that has ended. Why is that important? I remember I talked about a syllable being a C star, V C star. So suppose this was some waveform over here. What I could do is I could say that C star, V C star is a syllable. And the waveform where I have drawn this blue curve actually corresponds to syllable boundaries. So I know that this utterance 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It's made up of seven syllables. My text is made up of seven syllables. I parse it into seven syllables, like ka, ma, la, as I did. Suppose it was ka, ma, and la. Uh, I don't, can't see clearly what this is. Anyway, so I could do it, uh, I could divide it and then apply the machine learning algorithm and that has been a major contribution. And then we also use, looks, looked at what is called speckle change. I wanted to focus on this uh, very, this is frequency here and this is time. And you'll see that suddenly a lot of noisy stuff is there. And that noisy stuff actually corresponds to fricatives like your F, S and so on will have a lot of noise at the high frequency region. And you can actually mark them quite cleverly in this year. For example, you know, bubbles will have these strong frequency content. Then you'll have this noise here, it goes on to noise. And again, there is some bubble here because you have to have a syllable has to have a bubble. We keep going through this. So what we did was we put in a lot of signal processing into it. I mean, it's enough for you to grossly know that we took this machine learning algorithm, which is used in the West. And we said, correct this machine learning algorithm to know here there are boundaries. And the machine learning algorithm must work within those boundaries. So what I'm doing is, if I can find the boundary of ker, mer, and le, I want actually ker and a. Uh. So now instead of asking the machine learning algorithm to find the boundaries of all these units across this, I say look for the boundary within this, boundaries within this, and boundaries within this. And why is this important? To give you an idea, the duration of a vowel can be about 130 milliseconds, a duration of a consonant is barely about 30, maximum about 10 to 12 milliseconds. That's the fundamental problem. The duration, so you know, imagine in, initially I had a waveform which was, let's say, 140 milliseconds long. And I said, you know, put the consonant which is 70 milliseconds, another one which is 70 milliseconds, machine learning will require 100 hours to find the boundary of the sound. Because more the data, it will keep on correcting eventually. But what we said was, we said, no, this is going to happen much faster. And use that information to put the boundary earlier so the models get a lot more robust. It's a little vague, but I can't help it, so let me go through this. So what we did was, we needed to find these syllables. It's not trivial. Every bubble has what is, every syllable as we speak, has what, as you speak, for example, you are, um, you're producing sounds. How do you produce sounds? Your breathing, for example, is actually used for producing sounds too. And that's why we say don't speak while you eat, primarily because your every puff of air that you give, there's a vocal tract is like a tube, and it excites the vocal tract, produces the sound, and it will die. So there's an onset, there's an attack, and there's a decay. And that is what we saw in this waveform over here. There's an onset, there's an attack, and there's a decay. And this is called onset, nucleus, and coda. Onset, attack, and decay. And we did some clever signal processing. I'm not going to go into the details of it. So basically, we found 
there's a um, technique called group delay based processing. If some of you are interested, I can give you some. Basically, it says that I want, as I said, I want these boundaries very accurately. The syllable boundary should be very accurate for me. And this group delay based processing actually gives you very accurate syllable boundaries. And this figure actually shows something like that. I'm not going to go into the details of it. So let me skip this here. And your waveform here. And we do some processing. If you're interested, uh, something called short term energy is computed. Then we do some little bit more signal processing here, and it get you um, you get what is called a root capstrum. Those of you, again, uh, sorry, I'm just throwing some jargon at you, and you get what is called the group delay spectrum. And the peaks of this group delay spectrum actually correspond to the boundaries of the syllables. So it'll give me ka ma la. It will give me the boundary of ka, boundary of ma boundary of law, and then I tell this machine learning algorithm, here, take all the cars together, find the boundary between ka and a. It does much better instead of, it's like you know, taking a rubber and shaking it across the entire thing to find a boundary, and then saying, okay, this is shorter, it has to find the boundary. It makes it much easier for the machine learning algorithm to work with this. So we did this, and we performed this kind of, uh, so this gives you some statistics of where's the beginning and end of a silence here. So, by the way, silence is also a unit. It's very interesting. Uh, let me ask you something. Do you have any idea how, what is the duration of silence when you speak? You, you know, you speak words with, you know, gaps in between sentences with gaps in between. Anybody has any idea? If I say, you know, if X is the amount of time I'm speaking, what is the percentage of that X that I'm not producing any sound at all? It's about 60%. It's only 40% of the time you that you actually speak. Okay, it's very interesting. A lot of work on the sounds of silence is a big thing in speech recognition and so on. Because silences make a lot of info, give you a lot of information too. Okay, this is just an aside. Okay, so we got all these boundaries, and uh, this is just to give you an idea what it does. This is a sound put, and it should be from here to here. Let me see if it plays. But it's you see, let. This is what our algorithm does. It corrects it, and this is the sound. So it gets the putt very correctly. All that you need to do is look at this previous guy. This is what it was. So it took a part of the previous guy's vowel. Now, by now, you're familiar. There's a spectrum here. There's something that's going on here. And whereas this is the portion here that we need to look at, and then there's a silence here. Per is what is called an unvoiced. There should be some little bit of silence, and then the sound starts. And that's what we have done in throughout our algorithms. Let me give you some more examples. We also did, as I said, the spectral change that is there in producing these sounds. We call this hybrid segmentation. Why so? Because we're taking the waveform, divide it, dividing it using some information that we know about speech, and then we are subjecting it to the machine learning algorithm to learn the phone boundaries. There are lots of rules that we have produced for doing this. And let me give you another example here. This is supposed to be ta. It says ta again. Again, there's a mistake over here. As I said, this is very important, and then this gets corrected, something like this. Okay. And uh, there's another one. This kar is really bad. It's actually saying ich kar if you notice. And imagine if I put ich kar for kar in some other context, it'll sound with ich kar. That's the problem. And this is what it gets corrected as. Okay, so the previous waveform was the red guy. So, so if I, oops, if I look at this over here, this is where it was, and this is the correct one, and it gets corrected, and you can hear it, hear the sound differences between the two of them. Of course, you know it requires a lot of uh, listening uh, tests to hear this, and uh, this is just to show you numbers, uh, to show that actually the likelihood increases a bit across all the sounds. Likelihood is a machine learning way of finding out if the likelihood of the sound increases using that particular phone model, then you're happy with it. Of course, this minus 74.85 is e to the power of minus 74.85. You may say it's zero, but for us it matters as engineers. We use all of that. Even a small 0.5 difference makes a big difference to the census algorithm. Okay? This is probability, actually. Probability measured in log. If I take e to the power of that, that is actually the probability. But all these things matter quite a bit. This is what it's telling us. 
It's an important thing. And what I did was we also did the same thing with uh, combining um, neural networks at the, uh, and um, you know, there are, there are many machine learning algorithms. And uh, hidden Markov model is one such machine learning algorithm. Today, all of you might be hearing you know, deep neural networks based algorithms. And what are these deep neural networks? This is what is a deep neural network is. And what you do is you tell this guy that this waveform is starting and ending over here and give that as input. And then hopefully we put a whole lot of layers. And what do these layers do? Each layer actually does some kind of projection onto some particular space. If you, um, let me see if I can give you a feeling for this. If I have a point here in the Cartesian coordinate system, this is OP, let us say, that I can find the projection along the x and y directions, this is x and this is y. OK? Right. So if I say what is the projection along the x direction, you will say x. And what is the projection along y? You will say y is the projection. Right. So that's, uh, so what this neural network essentially does layer by layer, it keeps on projecting into various spaces. And because of that, what it does is, if the sounds are, um, how do I uh, put it? It can be, it, it, uh, the, um, the spaces need not be represented by linear spaces. I'm going to take a little bit of, um, let me uh, try and explain this a little bit to you. So now, if I say this is a point, OP, that is not really a vector, but it's a vector in what is called um, statistical modeled space. Let me give you a feeling for this. If I say that it comes from a particular distribution, OK, I'm going to make it a little bit, uh, try to make it a little easier. Suppose I say this is one distribution. Let me take a Gaussian, and this is another distribution. And I want to take this vector, which is defined as a weighted sum of these distributions, and say, OK, what is the projection along this? What's the projection along this? It's nonlinear, right? Because you want to find out the point in that density function, where does it belong? That is what you're looking at. Similarly, along the x, there's one density function. Along the y, there's a density function. We don't stop with single density functions. We say that it's a mixture of density functions. The distribution is something like this. Similarly, I'll have a distribution of density functions. The objective is to find, these are called super vectors, because we look at this point, which is defined as some, a, a, the, uh, the, uh, the, the point is expected to come from a weighted sum of density functions. And you have to find out what is the contribution of each one of these density functions to this point. And this is exactly what your neural network actually does try to learn in a very big way. The, earlier, we used to use a mathematical model of density functions and do it. Here, the, now the neural network actually finds these density functions quite accurately. Okay? So you have the, the, uh, there's a full uh, network over here. There's a convolutional neural network, and this is a deep neural network. They're two different forms. The only difference being that in the convolutional neural network, what, what we do is we believe there's a lot of averaging that goes on. And the averaging weights are shared across. We have what are called feature maps, which map from the input layer, because you want to measure various things. Like I told you, you know, I want to get the spectral change. I want to get the, um, what do you call the energy being dipping at a particular point. These are different projections. And for each one of them, I could have a separate feature map. And for each one of these feature maps, when the weights are shared, it becomes what is called a convolutional neural network. Deep neural network does not do that. It keeps going all the way. And the whole idea is, can we find, again, this is a, we want to find out which phone has occurred at a particular point, which sound unit occurred at a particular point. That is our objective. And we train. So what we do is we take these waveforms, give it with this boundary correction that we have done, learn the neural network model, which gives us the boundaries between sound units. And then we, then how is synthesis actually performed? We use, a, as I said, we have a hidden Markov model. Let us say I have a model for, it's actually a kind of a finite state machine. I'll tell you what this means. I have car here. I have R here. Again, going back to this example. Uh, the same R is copied here. 
but it will learn the context L and R. Okay? So what we do is we connect these guys and we ask it to generate the waveform. And each one has a distribution. And it will generate a point in this distribution. In addition to that, as I already told you, that the duration of R here, the duration of R here, the duration of R here, all of them can be different. Okay? So it, we also learn that. So it will figure out how much of the waveform should come from the state. So it has self-loop like this. And how much of the waveform should come from here? This is enough for you to know. It's a simple finite state machine. This is called a finite state machine. You're going in this particular order. I want to generate k. I want to generate a, m, r, la, for that matter. And each one, you say, how much duration should it generate it for? And also, the problem is, as I already told you, the r and ka, the a and ma, and the r and la is different. So it has to use context information. I'm giving you a very uh, skirty picture of it. Basically, it has to use all of that to produce this particular waveform. In addition to that, what are the other issues that we have? As I said, 40%, 60% of the time, we are not making any sound at all. These are called pauses. So actually, pauses also have to be predicted. If they're not predicted, what will happen? You'll hear overlapping of sounds one over the other. Okay? So we do all of this. And finally, we learn these waveforms. And we produce these sounds. And this is just to show you an example of even in the show how the, just as I showed in the earlier case, this is the manually marked boundary, sure. which is the correct one. And uh, this is when you use a flat start. When I take a waveform and just divide it into uniform parts, this is what it looks like. Sure. Show, this is what it does. It's not giving the show of the, for example. And uh, this is what we had earlier. Let me skip this. Let me show you this one, for example. This is the without the, there are deep neural networks and we wanted to use both of them and try it out. This is with the boundary correction that is done and this is how it's supposed to sound. And it is actually, I, actually identical to the manual marking of the syllable which has been very, very carefully mapped in that particular waveform and we find this is more or less accurate. Okay? So what we do is we, um, we did this for a large, we took a small subset of the Indic language databases and these are the various number of phones. As I said, this phones is a little bit loose because when I use an agglutinative nature, for example, akka, for example, a will be a phone, k will be a phone by itself, kka will also be a phone, amma, kk will be a phone, mm will be a phone, nn, anna will be a phone. Okay, that's how we increase the number of sound units that we have. And we do all of this and uh, this is a standard way of uh, evaluating the systems. What we did was um, we get, um, I mean, the idea is that we do what is called a mean opinion score. As I said, the consumer is you. And so we ask people to participate in this. And especially we ask people who have not participated in the last six months. They should not have participated in any evaluation because they know our voice very well. Okay? And we normally, IIT is such a good place, we have a lot of people with different languages, so it's not a problem. We always get a new set of people to evaluate. And what we do is we randomly play the natural utterance, the natural sentence, and the synthesized sentence. And different sentences we will play. We ask human beings to give a rating between 1 and 5. There's no 0 because the average will become zero, or some multiplication will get, get us a real problem. So we start with one which is poor, five which is excellent quality. To give you an idea, what is the meaning of this degradation? This is called a degradation MOS. And then what we do, we look at how they have scored the natural sentences. And with respect to that, we evaluate the synthetic sentences. Okay? The scores that I have here, 3.99, 3.17, 3.4, is not bad for a synthetic sentence. To give you an idea, your cell phone, which you're very happy with the voice, is between 3.5 and 3.8. Remember, in the cell phone, what is it doing? It's just transmitting the waveform, whatever the other person has spoken, verbatim, without doing any, uh, you know, producing a new sentence. And that is between 3.5 and 3.8. So for something which is doing vocabulary independent synthesis, this is reasonably good. Then we also do one more task. And this task is what is called word error rate. 
What we do is we ask people to listen. And what we do is we create here. The problem is I should not give you sentences which are predictable. Okay, Because you will all automatically predict all the words and write it. So what we do is we create completely semantically unpredictable sentences. For example, vanathil uh, urvellai, what do you call, yanai parakkiradu. You know, it's not something which is uh, semantically correct. Or, uh, you know, uh, what akash me ek, uh, what is, my god, I forgot an elephant. Huh? Ek hati nachtha gatha ja raha hai, something like that. We just change all of this, change the words, so that you cannot predict. Because human beings are so good at predicting what you're going to say and write it down. So we ask people to transcribe what you have heard. And the transcription gives you a sequence of words. We compare it with the original sequence of words that we meant to meant the systems to speak. And then we give what is called a word error rate. How many times did the system, the person nobody could figure out what the word was. Okay. So the two, and what is word error rate useful for? Word error rate is useful for intelligibility tests. Okay. And naturalness is your degradation mass. It's very interesting that your voice will sound beautiful, but you cannot transcribe it very carefully. So both are very important for us in the context of speech synthesis. And this gives you that um, the word error rates are not bad. It could be even better. I mean, we still have, for some languages, a little bit of uh, high uh, word error rate, which we still need to fix. But this DNN-based, we have many, many techniques for doing this. And the DNN-based boundary correction seems to do well. And similarly here, because the waveform boundaries were correct, you notice that the DMOS, the degradation MOS, is also pretty good. And anything about 3.5 is pretty good. I must tell you, the government is very happy with this because we promised them without, I must tell you, seven years back when we got into it, we didn't know what we were getting into. To give you an idea of what languages were at that time, lab-based systems, where you play the best system to the visitor that comes, it was about 1.5 MOS. And we promised a 3.5, and we are more or less there for all the languages. Okay, so this is what is the uh, evaluation, and there are various other techniques. Let me uh, close all this. Um, what I will do is I have a few more things to talk about. I want to um, I'll just play you the set of sentences, and you will still feel it's not so great, a lot of hype, but nevertheless. <laughs> This is one technique and this is another one. There are some small subtle differences. This is the to wear headphones to hear them. Let me play Tamil since there is a fairly large slightly better than the first one. And Tamil is a very difficult language, and our algorithm actually does pretty well on Tamil. And where is this from? This passage from? Only in Selvan, absolutely. Okay. Should I play some of the Malayalam, maybe? Andima Nimisham Mokini Parikatum Tolvi Kuda de Anna Vijayam Nadi other. It actually has a lot of voice. Um, and I must tell you, you know, when we, what is very good? The most important point is my lab, they do not know anything but Malayalam, and they built all the languages today. That is the plus of our technique. It simply does not matter. Once we get the script and we get the mapping to the common label set, it automatically does everything. That is the major contribution from what we have done in the lab. Okay. And um, then we, uh, we are also 
looking at other things like uh, prosody, maybe I'll c conclude in about uh, 10 minutes. The problem is that um, when you concatenate these waveforms and put them together like this, you'll find that one is having very high energy, the next unit is having low energy, and so on. These things need to be corrected. This is called prosody modeling. This is another, this is another dimension to speed synthesis. We have not done it so far. We've used the context and produced it. Now, if I wanted to read stories, this is not going to work. We need to do a lot more work on this. And we have to ensure that the intonation is correct, the duration of the sound is correct. Depending upon the particular context, it will increase the duration and so on. There are a lot of issues that we need to worry about. And we have tried to do some work on this, some starting work. Let me just play you some. Uh, we've taken care of. And the lots of, again, you know, it goes through a lot of machine learning again here. And you correct this. Let me uh, play this for you. This is the, um, this is the best thing that we have. Rail Mantri Suresh Prabhu ne kaha hai ki sarkar katne pehle pur rail budget mein janta ki aakang shaun ko pura karne ka har sambhav prayas kar rahi hai. So if you don't do this. Rail Mantri Suresh Prabhu ne kaha hai ki sarkar katne pehle pur rail budget mein janta ki aakang shaun ko pura karne ka har sambhav prayas kar rahi hai. You have to wear headphones to hear this. You actually hear an overlap of sounds. So you need to fix all this. You need to fix the boundaries in between. And this has to be done for any uh, arbitrary sentence. Of course, the Swedish Prabhu is long back. <laughs> anyway, so this is the, uh, these are the kind of things that you have to do when you worry about uh, speed senses. So one is building the voice and taking it forward. And uh, I think more or less, there are other efforts. We have also, oh, I don't have the bilingual here, I think. Oh, oh. We've also, see, one of the things that we, um, if you go to our website, you can look at it. We do have what is called the bilingual versions. Why do we need bilingual versions? Indian language is very interesting. Go to any website, there will be English words which are there, always. So now I can't say, you know, in fact, when we, we ran this course long time ago in uh, South, in Trichy, for a set of blind, visually challenged, I should not say blind, visually challenged girls. And what we did was, wherever there was Tamil, it would play the Tamil. And wherever there was English, there was an American English guy who was speaking the English. Then the girls came and told us that it's not speaking English properly. Can you fix it for us? So then we, I don't have, I forgot to uh, keep, uh, put, the, put examples of the systems here. Let me see, I might find another example there. And uh, what we did was we built actually 13 different flavors of English. Who said a tabard English is wrong, Telugu English is wrong, Balbu is Balbu in Telugu, it should be. Okay, it should be, and that's what it is. The Telugu person feels it's his English or her English. So that's, that's something that we also dealt with. So we, uh, let me, I'll give you that example. It's very interesting, the Hindi guy, and you know, it's very interesting. We say, uh, South Indians say competent, and the North Indian will say competent. And that's correct, as far as the North Indian guy, the way he's pronouncing it, because that's how you will understand it. Whereas, you know, as a South Indian, I'll say yum, whereas it should be M, as far as the North Indian says. So why not? So we did that, let me give you, I have another, uh, I think I should have it somewhere here. Let me go through this. <coughs> so if you're in, uh, the um, other technology passed of it, if you're interested, you can get back to me, experiments and results. Uh, hmm. Let me just see if I have it here. Oof. Ah, here. Yeah, let me play this bilingual for you. Deep video frequency trigger ki istemal bhi shamil hai. Jo silakan chip ke upar lagi shishe ki parat ko tod de. Aur ise chur mein badal de. So I don't know whether you noticed, he said silicon, silicon. The silicon is a very typical um, Hindi way of saying silicon. Another sentence here. Bihar sarkar ke upakram. Bihar State Electronic Development Corporation Limited को इस महत्वाकांक्षी योजना को ज़मीन पर उतारने की ज़िम्मेदारी सौंपी गई है। So it's bilingual. We call this bilingual. So basically, what it's doing is you can read both Hindi and English in text. On my uh, phone, I do have something which will read Hindi with a Tamil voice, Hindi Tamilalam with a Tamil voice, 
and so on because we have this common label set now i can map anything to anything so what if i you know if i don't uh, if i say instead of khana i say kana so what that's what we are looking at as, as number speaker and uh, so on so it's possible to do all of this stuff let me uh, oops mm. so let me get back to this So lots of other, I must tell you, you know, one thing is this is a complete consortium effort. As I repeat, there are 150, 100 to 150 engineers who have participated in this entire effort at various points in time. So, and uh, we've all worked together. It's very interesting that we've, I mean, we've managed to work together across the entire country and been able to put this together and the various other efforts which are there and it has created a lot of impetus for us. And um, applications we do have highlighting of text on the web. We've also built an online examination for visually challenged people. The idea is today, I don't know, uh, you know, the problem with people who are visually challenged or people with cerebral palsy, the government gives them one hour more to finish the exam. That's all. And there is a scribe, and if the scribe doesn't understand what the person is saying, especially people with cerebral palsy, because they have a, a you know, they have a chart using which they communicate their information. So the idea is that they can synthesize stuff themselves. We've already made devices for people with um, Vidya Sagar, a device called Kavi was built, where a person can communicate whatever he, she wants using our synthesizer where he formulates the sentence, just like you do SMS on your cell phone and produces the census uh, thing. And we also done this with a 10th standard exam. We actually did it online. We showed it to the Joint Commissioner for Education. He's very thrilled, but nothing happened after that. For Tamil, for Tamil Nadu, for example, the Tamil Nadu board exam can actually be written by a person who is visually challenged using the text to speech census system. You wonder how the person types, okay? It's very interesting that in less than a week, they can learn all the keyboard positions, absolutely. And then they have the headphone on and they do all the typing of the answers. As long as it reads the answers for them, they can submit their answers online, do this stuff. Quite a bit of work, but it did help. And now we have ported it to various things. Samsung is, was, was our first thing. And then any Android-based system now, Akash tablet also we had uh, uh, ported it to. Then we also have something which does an OCR. For example, you have a newspaper, it scans the text and then converts it to text, and then you pass it through the text to speech census system. And then we, are also, we also have another uh, speech recognition system for farmers, which gives you the prices of commodities online. Why is this important? Again, basically what happens is, um, today there are a lot of middle persons. You have the Reliance Fresh and everything. The farmer, for example, is quite happy with the Reliance Fresh or Heritage or Maxworth or whatever, I don't know whatever those companies are because the company buys the entire produce that the person makes. So what the government has done is they have this website called, uh, you call a number called 1551, and it will give you the price of commodities as defined on that day by the uh, Food Corporation of India. It's uploaded on the web by um, National Informatics Center. So we crawl the web, get the prices, and we play the prices back in various Indian languages. That, uh, that's again a 12 language consortium where you can give the price of the commodity, you can say, I want Vendeka price today, and it will tell you. In addition to that, Tamil Nadu government, for example, has 80,000 80, farmers on its board, and they have actually marked their areas, what crops do they grow, and they will tell you, if this is your, uh, during this time, Vendeka will have this shriveling of the shoot. What should you use as pesticide? All this information is sent today by SMS in English, so they're changing this to send SMS in Indian languages, and the phone that I have will actually read the SMS for the person who's not literate, okay? That's exactly what we can do, crop information being done. And as I said, we've done a um, workshop for visually challenged persons to learn word process, spreadsheet, email, internet. We ran this for about five years. This was done with an organization called Darshini in uh, Adyar, which works with visually challenged people as scribes. We've trained about 100, 180 persons, and today I'm very proud to say all these 180 guys are employed in some kind of IT or some kind of job. Some of them are faculty in various places. And uh, there was one guy who was doing his M MPhil thesis when he came to our lab. And suddenly he felt the whole world opened up because he could you know, access the entire internet. And he actually got his best thesis award for his MPhil thesis from uh, Madras Christian College. We were proud, very proud of him. 
And of course, we have won a few, it was launched, first screen reader, that was called a screen reader that was launched in, by Minister of State Sachin Pilot in 2011. And um, we won, uh, we were in the top 74 finalists in Manthan Award. We got a GE Innovation uh, Research Expo Award. It was great because my lab got one lakh for this as a prize money and they went to Manali to enjoy the. <laughs> so it's things, even good things can happen. You can get money unexpectedly. We launched the SMS Reader and teach us in nine languages and good governance day 2015. And we, today we have signed, uh, Wipro we have signed an MOU with Samsung, we have signed MOUs with Shinano Technologies, various people coming forward to put the uh, TTS system. Those of you who are interested, <coughs> this is the website here uh, where you can play these synthesizers, but under Dawn Lab, there is a, if you are uh, interested in building speech synthesis systems, slash TTS, is the other website that is there, which has all the data marked accurately at the phone level for you. So if you want, and then there are scripts, which will give you, if you're a computer science savvy person, you can actually run through the scripts, build your own voice, okay? If you're given everything, everything is free for commercial, non-commercial, anything. If anybody is interested, we want people to use it. And that's all that we are trying to encourage. And of course, thank you very much for your attention. And of course, there are some acknowledgments. My guide, Agnayana, who taught us the segmentation, my group delay functions was uh, his idea. And Madhumurthy and Chandrasekhar, forever my, you know, you always need that uh, devil is your advocate, right? You need that devil's advocate. These were my devil's advocates. And of course, my teacher, my students who continue to who teach me and have taught me all the time through these 30 years. Without their help, I simply could not have, we could not have uh, achieved whatever it is. It belongs to every one of us. And those of you who are interested, um, I don't know how many of you, I just uh, put this slide every, every year. Interspeech is a speech conference which is coming for the first time to India, okay, in the last 30 years. And it is going to be held in Hyderabad. It has an audience of about 2,000 people. So if you're interested as a, you know, if you want to, Come and figure out what's going on in speech. And in India, speech recognition and census, I think, are very, very important, primarily because the literacy levels. What's the literacy level in our country? Okay. Hmm? It's supposed to be 65%. 65% means people can put their signature. And how many people are tech savvy? All of you use English, right? It's about 2 to 3% of the population that's tech savvy speech will perhaps be the next revolution. We hope, like the telecom revolution, which brought in your cell phones, we hope that teach, uh, speech will bring the entire set of marginalized sections of society into the mainstream. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> yeah, if there are any questions, comments, uh, I can show you this thing if you're interested. I can't connect this, but if you can, um, I'm not very good with the smartphone. So let me try my best. My student has put something for me. Oops. Anyway, yeah, are there any questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, can you raise your hand? I'll bring the mic to you. OK, I'll start with you. Mom? Yeah. So far, you have been talk, uh, you have been like about the different Indian languages and the way how you have transcripted mm. them in a simpler form. Mm. Is that possible for even songs that is in music? To uh, good point. We also do some work on music, matching the lyrics. Is that what you're asking, right? Matching Just like the I'm, lyrics yes, and the tone the lyrics in which they are and the waveform is a pretty difficult task. There is some work that has been done on lyric matching for Western music, and they are quite successful. What they do is they batch the vowels, and the rest of it they assume is correct. Indian languages, Indian music is harder, especially with, uh, to some extent, with, whether it's Hindustani classical or Carnatic classical, or even folk for that matter, when we have the same line sung in very many different ways. When it's sung in very many different ways, transcribing is a very hard problem, we are struggling with that, not yet, it's not there, right. We have done things like, you know, if you're a, I have a student who's working on Elay Raja's music, and then uh, we're able to say which genre it is. 
there are some five different genres, and we can tell you which genre is the song belonging to, where it uses the lyric, and it also uses the music. Both together can be done. Yeah. Any other questions? More questions? Raise your hand. Uh, I'll Sorry? Is the concept Sanskrit? Yeah. So? No, did you use that as? It doesn't matter. The same census algorithm works for Sanskrit also. We didn't work on it. Okay. Um, JNU, there was a per, um, one person, Pandey, was given the task of doing Sanskrit, and we actually helped them build the Sanskrit synthesizer. Okay. Yeah. Some more questions? Raise your hand. Uh, are there more questions? Please raise your hand. Okay. So I could have. <coughs> uh, who is it? Who raised their hand? No, nobody raised their hand as far. Oh, there. Okay. Oh, that girl wants to ask. Ma'am, um, uh, do we have any transformation or process, uh, the language which does not have a written form? Yes. Uh, yeah, because yes, in yes, India yes, there are yes. many languages yes. that do not have script. Yes, actually we have started working with um, uh, one of these Tulu or something right now, Tulu. And what we're doing is, of course, Tulu is getting written in Kannada scripts. So what we do is, now that we have MSR Europe, um, in, a, in a way, the 13 languages that we worked with is actually a richness of it. So what we did is we took all the 13 language data together, then it becomes enough data. We have about 13 languages plus Indian English, it's about 550 hours of data. Then we transcribe Tulu. And then we correct it based on the mapping of sounds. It's possible to do it today. Yeah, and actually it's interesting that um, you know, we've done many other experiments like a new language which has very little data. Can we build the voice with small amount of, like, you know, I talked about, uh, you know, five to ten hours of data is what we've taken. All this was built using five hours of data. We've also done with 20 minutes of data. So for example, I have a particular Tamil voice and you want your Tamil voice, then it's like five minutes of data to adapt and it'll work. It's possible to do such things too. Anyone else? We have t time for one more question. Okay. Ma'am, yeah. again, uh, the languages for what you have done are already existing. Mm. So my question is, is there a possibility like the same process can be done for the upcoming languages? Yeah. Like in Bahubali, we have the new language called Kiliki. It has been See, made. as long as it is, OK. That I don't know what, I have not seen Bahubali, so I do, cannot comment on it. But I can tell you this. As long as languages are what we call syllable timed. Syllable time means Indian languages are syllable timed. We speak at the rate of, you know, at a particular rate of syllables per second. English is what is called stress, stress time. Let me give you, try to give you an example. When I say dogs chase cats. Then the dog is an emphasized stressed word. Chase is a stressed word. Cats is a stressed word. Those dogs chase cats, chase the cats. It's interesting that the duration of those dogs and earlier dogs will be the same. These are called stress timed languages. Those dogs chase the cats. That's how I would pronounce it because I'm an Indian. But if you ask a British guy to say it, he'll say, those dogs chase the cats. And it'll all be like the same duration. Indian languages are all syllable timed. As long as it's a syllable timed language, it's fine. It's interesting that English spoken only in Britain and in parts of Britain is still stress timed. And in America, it's a little bit stress timed. But English, which has been borrowed everywhere across thanks to the British Empire, is syllable timed English. So we do the same. Whatever we did for English, we use the same ideas which we did for Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, whatever. It it's possible to do it. Bahubali, I do not know. I have to check what this language is. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Uh, so did you find any, say, theoretical idea which is of interest to linguists themselves which they had not thought about? Yeah, in fact, many of the language rules which we have identified have come, it's actually, you know, we got machine learning to do it for us and the rules for the uh, parsing of the text, for example. The uh, linguists would just call it an exception. We have actually found there are some underlying rules that, that are there, and we have confirmed with the linguists that what we have found is actually quite correct, especially in the context of Hindi. And Hindi, when you do it, it works for Gujarati, it works for Marathi, it works for uh, 
Assamese, Bengali, and so on. Yeah, we've done some things like that. But I cannot say that um, beyond that, I mean, the problem is linguists have never tried to build speech synthesizers, so it's not fair, you know, whatever we have done for that matter. But most of our work has been primarily, I'm not even sure that you need a script anymore. That's what we are driving towards. Is really a script required? It's something that we need to figure out. It doesn't matter, any language can be converted into a set of scripts, but then you type it into something, then we have to see how to make it work. It's not clear to us. We are saying that, because the way it has been is that you take all Indian languages, the things are similar except that the phonotactics is different. The sequencing is what is different. Sequencing of syllables is all that is different. So more or less they are a common set and there's a lot of borrowing actually. People have written quite a lot of literature on this from the West on the borrowing across various languages and across the sounds. So it's um, plenty of work has been done and we have to just, we are, we are only uh, corroborating what they are saying by the experiments that we have performed. Just one last question. Yeah. Mama, you said, you said words like khana is produced differently in South India, like mm. we have only one ka. Mm. Uh, and uh, this synthesizer adapts to our khana also. Khana we say is khana. Mm. So won't the language, original language lose its original Yeah, but you know what time? is original language is the question that I would like to ask. You know, uh, Tamil is supposed to have come from the Indo Indus scripts. And if you look at scripts today and what was there in Harappan, the evolution that happens. I believe there's going to be borrowing and uh, borrowing will actually enrich the language. So, and you know, so many things, for example, if you, you know, we make so much about aspiration in Hindi, you know, the khana, the, uh, what is a ghar and so on. The frequency is very few, very sure, very, very, very less. And you look at the waveform, the aspiration will not be seen. A little bit of semblance of aspiration will be there. Nobody is speaking in a correction, my ghar ja rahi, you know, my ghar. There will be a little bit of it, that's all. Very, very short. So I think it's all, uh, I mean, at least from the waveform and what we have learned through machine learning and all, I somehow, I'm not someone who subscribes to it. Okay, there is a difference, but it's very, very small difference. And aspirated consonants in Hindi are very few. When you, in continuous speech, if you have done some statistical analysis of it, in fact, even in your type, your SMS, for example, that is used. Aspiration, you have to press some three keys to pr produce the aspiration. Whereas for the normal sound, which is your unvoiced top consonant, is your most popular, and you just have to do it with one key. Uh, Mom, what is your next challenge? Our next challenge is to make uh, story reading possible. With in intonation, like? Yes, with intonation, and somebody says, Balu, you want to hear Balu there. We want to make sure that it happens, and that's completely non trivial. I mean, in the text, for example, when you read a story, you know that. Uh, one big problem with Indian languages is, I mean, it's very recent, the idea of punctuation marks. I did not talk about this. You don't put commas. There's no commas, no, no apostrophe. Take your many of your old text. So what we do is all this prediction as to where there should be a silence. For example, the teacher said the student is a fool. The teacher said the student is a fool. The teacher said the student is a fool. I'm just changing the location of the pauses. And it makes completely different meaning. So all this thing has to be done, and we have to do it automatically from the text and the context. In fact, it's interesting that when you read a chapter, paragraph to paragraph, your intonation will change. For, for example, suppose you lose your bag. I lost my bag. Then the next one, which bag? The bag that I brought somewhere. Then that, the bags in all these three sentences will be different. This is called everyday prosody, not only stories. When you're having a conversation, the intonation will be different. There's familiarity with that word. The same word when it comes back again. My system will not do it. Okay. The same word comes again. There's already you know about it, so you're going to speak it differently. And all this has to be taken care of in the speech census system. Is it possible to bring something like Siri into uh, regional languages? Uh, yeah, actually we have talked to Apple. Apple is using our data right now. For, but, but we don't have data for speech recognition. Siri does both recognition and the synthesis. They are building their index voices using our data right now because Microsoft, Siri, uh, Microsoft, Apple, all of them are, because we've put everything free on the web and many of them have told me informally that they first build the voice using our data. But they want to do 50 hours of data in every language. Right now they're working with Hindi, 50 to 100 hours. So that is something that's going to take them a lot of time.